The Gift on Clearance, first appearing on The Hidebound Press, December 16th, 2021. Human fertility is falling in every nation in the world, and the human population is projected to peak in the year 2040. By mid-century, most advanced economies will be beset by an inverted pyramid of age demographics, wherein the young will be outnumbered by the elderly, sometimes by a factor of four to one. In other times and places, this would be considered calamitous. But in the modern West, this is an achievement to be celebrated. Our misanthropic tradition of the past 50 years to sterilize and divest ourselves of our reproductive faculties has, in truth, sought with alacrity this goal of fewer human beings in toto. Now it merely seems that we will finally receive what we have asked for. Some professional famous people, like Mr. Elon Musk, have decried this state of affairs and noted the obvious ill effects that total population decline coupled with longer lifespans will have on the world's economies. This is a point that needs to be raised particularly because people have been sold a bill of goods in regard to the regime's line on human reproduction. Having less children has not been a net benefit for society, and as a matter of fact, our dearth of children, as well as our lack of investment in the ones we already have, will positively impoverish our world. Four old people per one healthy young worker is an abstraction. Perhaps you would prefer more concrete illustrations. Warehouses of the old and infirm, with no living family to care for them, consigned to slowly waste away on what meager means the government can afford to provide, cared for and necessarily neglected by an overstretched hospital and care staff of impoverished, primarily immigrant nurses. A complete and total end to the consumer economy. A collapse in useful trades like manufacturing, construction, infrastructure, and other skilled occupations as those industries trend towards older and older workforces. Crushing tax burdens such that those who do work see little reward for their efforts, certainly not enough to support a family of their own. The latter is the most troubling as it will create a feedback loop constantly depressing fertility. This is to say nothing of the utter disintegration of families or chemical and environmental factors contributing to overall birth rate decline. Contrary to what the Bill Gates of the world will tell us, this is not, quote-unquote, sustainable in any meaningful sense. It is a recipe for civil unrest, poverty, and totalitarianism as governments around the world hijack their economies and the lives of private citizens in an effort to fix the damage they themselves inflicted with their negligence or impositions. The new death cult the world finds itself enthralled to will bring misery. This is only the latest illustration of what we know to be the case. Rather than dwell on these facts, let us consider instead what God in the teleology of our own personhood is pointing us towards. In some sense, it is fitting that I write this during Advent, when all of Christendom is pregnant and waiting for the Christ child. Pregnancy and fertility are central messages not only of Advent, but of the Christian religion. In the case of the Blessed Virgin, her pregnancy is not only the means by which she participates in salvific history, but also an image of God's grace active in the Church. For just as the mother is acted upon from outside by the husband and thus conceives and is transformed within herself, giving rise to new life, so the bride of Christ is entered into by the bridegroom in a qualified and analogical sense and made pregnant with the potential of salvation. In literary history as well, writers have always associated eros with true fecundity, and even pagans can understand the evil of frustrating this natural end of human sexuality. I think, for example, of Ovid's rendition of Pygmalion. In love with his statue of womanhood, his eroticism is sterile and masturbatory. It is only when Venus transforms the sculpture into a real woman that Pygmalion's disordered desire for beauty becomes reordered and reintegrated. It is the pagan ideal of Eros as a great good that is preserved in the English literary tradition as well. A particular example I might point to is a fantastic country home poem called Two Penshurst by Ben Jonson, 
a pastoral in the style of Horace, which contains such lines as, But all come in, the farmer and the clown, and no one empty-handed to salute thy lord and lady, though they have no suit. Some bring a capon, and some a rural cake, some nuts, some apples, some that think they make the better cheeses bring them, or else send their ripe daughters, whom they would commend this way to husbands, and whose baskets bear an emblem of themselves in plum or pear. And these, Penshurst, are thy praise, and yet not all, thy ladies noble, fruitful, chaste withal, his children thy great lord may call his own. A fortune in this age, but rarely known are they, and have been, taught religion, thence their gentler spirits have sucked innocence. Each morn and even they are taught to pray with the whole household, and may every day read in their virtuous parents' noble parts the mysteries of manners, arms, and arts. I encourage readers to glance through the poem in its entirety, but I have highlighted its major motif in these excerpts, i.e. that human fertility, closely tied with the fertility of the land and coupled with innocence and virtue, are a, quote, fortune in this age rarely known. If it were a fortune in Johnson's day, how much more in our own? Indeed, that is what we are leaving on the table, a fortune. Human fertility is a bountiful gift which God has seen fit to give us, and we are leaving it on the store shelves. The gift which Mary knew, the gift which Ovid's Venus and the serfs and lords of Johnson's Penzers well apprehended, has been placed away on clearance this holiday season. But there is a maxim, or perhaps more of a tautology, that we of a more traditional bent would be wise to keep in mind. The future belongs to those who show up for it, or more bluntly, the future belongs to those who exist.